eight bowels because I need all the fiber I can get. Oh, dude, that's classic. <laughs> classic Matt just eating everything. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we should be streaming now. Apologies right. to folks who might have been waiting. Both of you, we're very sorry. <laughs> um, More sorry about the conversation that you came in on. Yeah, unfortunately. All right, let's let's uh, let's do this. Hold on. Where's my stupid thing? There it is. <laughs> yeah, let's do this. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm not oh, ready. Okay, now. Oh, wait. No. Okay, now. Okay, now I'm, I'm ready. Seriously. Okay. This time, I'm ready. Welcome to Wood Talk. For woodworkers, by woodworkers. Now, here are three guys who, if combined, would make one hell of a woodworker. Mark, Matt, and Shannon. All right, welcome to Wood Talk number 152 for October 7th, 2013. On today's show, we're talking about essential hand tools for power tool woodworkers, router speeds, keeping a sharp edge on your tools, and using bandsaw blades for hand saws. But before we get to all that, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. I have to find a play button. There it is. We'll wait. Today's show is supported by Festool, helping woodworkers get better results in less time and with less mess to clean up afterwards. Visit them online at festoolusa.com. All right. Quick uh, announcement. Of course, we talked about it the last couple of shows coming up on October 19th. It's imminent. It's it's coming soon is our meetup that we're going to have at the Keystone Bar and Grill in Covington, Kentucky. So around uh, sometime between 6 and 7, let's just say 6.30-ish. Uh, whenever you get over there from the show, uh, we'll be having this great meetup. We're going to have some food, some drinks, do some belly dancing, maybe, maybe like uh, autograph unusual body parts. Mm, that's, that's, I'm going to bring my special Sharpie then just for that one. It's <laughs> gonna a fine have, tip. Uh, I'm going to have Matt sign my boobs, and uh, <laughs> it's going to be a good time. I'm not exactly sure how long we're going to be there, but we have the room for the night so I know that there's a there's a plane Sounds makers like panel or dinner or something like that going on right around the same time. Yeah. So um okay. you know, feel free to come by after any of the other events. There's liable to still be uh knowing this crowd, there's liable to still be quite a few people there. Bring your pillows because we're sleeping over. <laughs> they may be a little bit louder and more obnoxious than they were at six thirty. That's true. And, by, and by if 10 you o'clock. get there before we do, don't worry about it. You you can mention who you know who you're there for and they'll probably give you a blank stare because <laughs> well they have no who? idea. Who? Yeah. I think we should do like a, a dance contest to the hand tool excuse me, to the wood talk uh, theme music because that's awesome. You could just keep playing that as far as I'm concerned. Okay. It's groovy. I'll do it. Whoops, that's loud. The best improv of Tom's tips. That might be a good one, too, especially after a few drinks. Yeah. I think I could dance to this. I totally. Think, couldn't you? I've got the hips for it. It'd be great. All right. Well, anyway. It's got a little bit of an Austin Powers <laughs> feel to it, <laughs> It too. does, yeah. A little retro. All right. Let's move into what's on the bench. Talk about what we've been doing in the shop. I am delving into the world of humidors even deeper, and the rabbit oh. hole continues to to just keep going. <laughs> I did go to that puff puff.com forum, which by the way is super annoying unless you sign up and get rid of that ad that just continually plays and plays and plays and doesn't stop. Um, nothing like forcing your members, like forcing people to join to, to read some content on there. But anyway, um, so these guys are actually very helpful. Just I didn't have to ask any questions. It was all kind of there. Like all the stuff I was wondering about has clearly been laid out in terms of like humidification and uh, what type of medium people are using these days and their preferences. So uh, very, very helpful stuff if you're looking to to build a humidor. And uh, this humidor is going to be veneered on the outside. So I've got an old box of veneers that I've been hanging on to for, for years now, but I've been kind of just not really going to do anything big with them. I've been holding on to them for small projects or marketry even. And I uh, just looked through it. Nothing was really catching my attention like, oh, yeah, this is it. This is what I want to use. So I went to uh, the Joe Woodworker website, veneersupplies.com. And oh my gosh, 250 bucks later, <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple boxes of veneer uh, being shipped via UPS to my door. So, oh my gosh, that sounds dangerous. That's, you're probably spending more on the veneer than I would spend on a year's <laughs> worth of cigars. Dude, it's just, <laughs> and of course I'm thinking well beyond just this, this humidor, but once you start looking through that website, it's just so easy to add this amazing, I mean, when we're talking veneer, it's super highly figured, some of those most gorgeous stuff you've ever seen um, that you would never be able to get in in solid wood. And I just couldn't stop clicking. And it's add to cart, add to cart, add to cart. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited about that. Looking forward to it. Oh, wait, so you stuff. have 
totally. you have a new issue now. We're going to have to do an intervention. I Mark, so. put down the burl. You guys got to go there and just dig around and, and you tell me if you can get out of there without spending some money. <laughs> I had a, I had my plywood buyer come to my office the other day and he said, uh, um, you know, I got this extra sheet of veneer that's got some tears in it. Um, do you want it? And of course, you know, my immediate answer is, yeah, sure. I, and it's veneer usually comes shipped like between two pieces of quarter inch, like cheapo plywood, just mm-hmm. to keep it flat and keep it protected. So I cut the tape and I pulled this open and it's like this beautiful, like burl crotch walnut, <laughs> two, two by four piece of veneer. And I mean, yeah, it's ripped and it's got several holes um, in it, but you know, that's what veneer tapes for. <laughs> it's just like, seriously, you yeah. gonna give this to me? So, okay. so that actually, that's a good question then that, I'm, that I was thinking about. It, as a hand tool, exclusive hand tool user, do you work with veneer very often? Is that something you'd have to make special exceptions for? Uh, you know, because obviously you're using plywood now uh, or some sort of su- um, uh, sheet good substrate. Not necessarily, no. Um, I mean, I, I would say, do I, have I done much with it? I could probably count on one hand. Yeah. Um, on on a shop teacher's hand, the number of times that I have used <laughs> three, veneer, um, but probably the number of times that I've wanted to use veneer. Um, I mean, I definitely want to play around with some marketry. I've only done, you know, real real simple kind of practice exercise type things. Right. So I've got a like you. I've got a box. Um, actually, probably from the same guy from Paul Church, <laughs> <laughs> a box full of veneer for that type of stuff. But when it comes to um, you know furniture and stuff, I mean. Traditionally, it was done on a solid wood core. Right. Um, Is that how you would do it then? You wouldn't go with uh, plywood or MDF? You know, I'm I'm actually not sure. I guess it would depend on what I was gonna do. If I if I had to, like, if I needed to put a, a molded edge on the end or something, mm-hmm. um, and I needed to like wrap it with solid wood, I yeah. would probably say screw this and just hold, do the whole thing on a solid wood. Right. Right. Um, I if I it would make your joinery I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not adverse to using plywood at all. It just doesn't come up very much in my right. in my shop. Right. So, well, I'll tell you, the humidor. What's great about it is most of it is solid wood, and you're veneering one one side of it. So once that veneer is glued on there, for the most part, joinery wise, if you're using hand tools, it's pretty much going to act like it is solid wood once you get through that veneer layer. So, right, right. Uh, but that's about it for me. How about you, Matt? Well, the big thing for me is. Maybe I should start thinking about veneer. Oh, wait, I can't because my bandsaw has a really crappy blade on it right now, which I discovered right in the middle of something that I was really, really kind of hoping uh, would give me a really great result, but it didn't. So basically, I've been talking about this on Facebook uh, the past couple of days because I was so irritated with it yesterday, but I'm working on the platform bed, and I've got this really great eight-quarter maple, and maybe this is like one of those lessons for myself for much further on down the line just because i have it and because i i'm confident with the right blade uh and given the right time i could do it myself doesn't mean that i should do it (laughs) what i really should have done was stop being so cheap and just bought some four quarter and called it good (laughs) nice so what ended up happening was i was trying to rip this eight quarter into obviously two uh narrower pieces thinner pieces and at first I was thinking, all right, the, I was trying to use uh, my, my rip fence and then I had um, a, a roller face, basically a, a mag switch roller face on the opposite side. And I was convinced that I must have jarred the, the, the roller face loose or something because it, it is loose. It's a little bit, there's a little wobble in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but what ended up happening was I noticed that the blade was really, really going wonky. It was tracking way off. It was just following the grain any direction it wanted to go. And I know, number one, I had it tensioned properly. I know, number two, a lot of people are saying, well, did you have it tracked in? Uh, I Once I put the blade on, I get it tracked in the, the rips, uh, rip fence all set up for that particular cut. I don't, I don't mess around with it again. There's not really a need to mess around with it again unless, you know, I decide that I – just really have nothing else to do, so I'm going to go ahead and play around with it. I feel confident that it's still in position. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm running all these things through my head, and the only one that is the obvious answer is the blade is dull. And in hindsight, that explains why I was trying to rip some pine with it and was like practically having to have the family get behind me to shove it through. <laughs> that should have been sign. the first sign. <laughs> yeah, that it's a dull blade. Right. <laughs> nice. So are you getting a uh, new wood slicer or what are you replacing it with? Yep. In fact, actually, I just contacted them today and said, hey, I, I, I need one. I was almost going to pay like the extra shipping, but I was thinking, you know, 
I already contacted the folks over at Bell Forest and said, why don't you send me some four quarter? I'm going to go ahead and just do that because I don't – by the time all this stuff happens, I, I they could have easily sent it to me and then I could have gotten everything taken care of. So what I'm going to do is in the grand scheme of things, I'm moving on to a different portion of the build uh, that, where I don't need – that four quarter stock at the moment or the equivalent of the four quarter, right. I'm going to move on to something completely different where I can still use this eight quarter so I don't slow myself down. But yes, I'm, I'm getting a new blade and I cannot wait for it to get here. And I'm, I'm going to take that wood to town and just do it anyways, <laughs> just, just to teach it a lesson. Just because you can. Exactly. Have you ever resawn something like that on that saw before? Not that thickness and okay. uh, not that size. Cause the board I was actually doing, was uh, approximately five inches wide. So it's already getting close to maxing out. It's a 14-inch bandsaw, so it's already getting ready to max out that maximum height. So I think the maximum is like six inches because uh, I, I don't have the uh, um, the riser block on it. So right. it, it's getting close to that point. It's also, it's like I said, it's eight quarters thick, and it's the first time I've ever done it with this material. The other thing, which I haven't really mentioned, was the board was six feet long. And so that's kind of like this, this levering action. Like as I was pushing it, I was towards the back, like trying to make sure that it was staying in position. So I have a feeling that that might've messed with it the first time I did it. But this morning, because I will not be defeated, dang it. I went downstairs, <laughs> I reset things up. I put a different type of uh, featherboard on it so that it's going to stay super flush against the, uh, the rip fence. And this time I kept my hands right up near well, not too close to the blade, but closer to the blade so that I could keep control over how it's being fed into it. And sure enough, about um, maybe a few inches into it, I immediately saw the blade start tracking off to the side. So I just shut it down and said, all right, I'm done. I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> nice. So, Sounds good. Yeah, it was a good time. Good time had by all. Definitely. The family <laughs> enjoyed all the uh, drama uh, <laughs> the upstairs. The curse words they were coming from me. the basement. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, but anyways, that's, that's my good time. How about you, Shannon? What do you got going on? Well, I uh, finished up my treadle lathe, so what? I am officially uh, officially done building lathes. Nice. Um, Until just... the next one. Exactly. <laughs> oh, did your limb come down? Can I borrow that? <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm ready to getting back to building some furniture. Um, it's been fun, and it's honestly, it's been one of the more challenging things I've ever built. Um, you know, building a piece of furniture that can withstand, you know, somebody sitting on it or, you know... Um, you know, a drawer opening or closing is totally different than building something that needs to spin freely at 1200 RPMs and <laughs> not, you know, rub or shift around and, and bind. It was a very, very, uh, it was a humbling experience. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I was able to build a really rock solid frame, but all the, just dealing with the bearings and getting everything aligned. And then, you know, several different test runs where suddenly something went out of alignment when you got it up to speed and got to shim something and lock it in place, but not too tight. You know, it's just, <laughs> it was, um, yeah, it's why I'm a woodworker and not a metal worker or an engineer. But, uh, I gotta say, I'm, I'm thrilled. The thing works like a dream. Um, there's a couple of, I've got a few joints that I need to draw bore and a couple of decorative type molded type things for, pretty the pretty effect that they need to do but uh it, it's working in fact i've already turned a better pulley for it so that it runs even a little bit smoother but yeah i'm ready to to move on i'm going to build a shaker pedestal table next you know that kind of iconic one from uh uh what is it pleasant hill in kentucky mm -hmm. okay uh, pleasant hill shaker village i'm going to make that next and i'm just excited to uh to be done with it frankly and be so able to actually use it so, so what you're saying is you're trying to move away from kinetic projects to more of a static <laughs> project. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if all I have to do is turn the lathe, turn the column so that it looks pretty and it doesn't have to move or, you know, have things that, that blink and <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> Make noise. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Well, that but, sounds cool. I was hoping yeah, you were so, going to start so going contrary, into mass production of them. Yeah, no, not so much. <laughs> But yeah, contrary to popular belief, I only have three lathes. Well, I have four because I have an actual electric mini lathe. I have a bungee lathe in the backyard. I have a pole lathe. And now I have a treadle lathe. So all the other prototypes I've done have been given to new homes where other people can enjoy them. Well, you Hold say on. contrary to popular belief, but then, you're, but then you follow up with, but I actually only have four. <laughs> oh, oh, believe me. I'm not sure I've what heard, this is contrary I've, to. <laughs> I've heard eight. I, I've seen five thrown around a lot. Okay, uh, okay. Six has been the number of, of 
uh, that everyone seems to be gravitating towards in the last couple of weeks. Fair enough, fair enough. All right. Well, I'm going to go online and see if I can find other forms of lathes for you to build because I, I don't think you should be done yet. <laughs> you, still got, you have work to do, Shannon. Yes, yes, it's true. I haven't done that. It's your that calling. Rockin' foot-powered pole lathe that you see on YouTube all the time. There you go. All it's right, let's uh, let's move into what's new because we've got a couple links to share with you here. Mark sent me a link, Mark with a K, uh, and this is a awesome video of some old-timey Swedish woodworkers. There's no sound at all. It's just video that's uh, sped up to show the process. It's of because them. there was no sound then. <laughs> they actually, yes, everyone just made no noise whatsoever. It wasn't invented yet. And uh, it's it's wild. You got to watch it. It's one of those things where even without sound as a woodworker, you're just intrigued. Um, it, it, they're making clogs out of wood that seems to be related to butter because like... <laughs> there's like no grain whatsoever, and there's absolutely like the, the, these tools must be super sharp. But of course, it's probably green wood as well. Um, but ultimately, the the way it just chews through the wood, and they're able to make wooden shoes and spoons and chairs is just awesome to watch. It's so fun to watch. Well, you know, the reason why we 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 don't know what wood species that is it isn't so much because of the quality of the film. It's because it, they made so many things out of it. They used up all the trees. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> they don't it's exist gone. anymore. <laughs> yes. I believe it's beach, actually. Is it? Okay. Uh, I mean, if it's Scandinavian clogs, I, I think someone will jump forward and correct me if I'm wrong. But I remember watching a woodwright shop where that was discussed. And I mean, green, green wood in general is a religious experience when it comes to workability. It's just so soft. It's yeah, nice. It's buttery. And, and some yep. of the things he, he does there, if you're used to working with like kiln dried hardwoods, you would just go, how is you're that like, even possible? <laughs> Seriously, what? That is impossible, but it's awesome. So you, you got to check it out. We'll Maybe that's that. why I haven't been having good experiences so far with my lathe is because I keep seeing videos like this and I'm like, how come my shavings aren't doing that? <laughs> Long I mean, 10 I cut foot myself ribbons. <laughs> yeah, quite a different experience. <laughs> Sweet. Well, hey, let's move on to this next. Remember last week, Somebody sent us a link, and it was, like, the most amazing furniture ever. Mm -hmm. Just those weird designs. Not weird. Weird as in, like, I hate you designs because they're so amazing. I think it was, like, as in, I have no idea how that's done. <laughs> exactly. It's like, yeah. that's that's not right. That's not it's human. It's unfair. It's unfair. That's right. Anyway, so our good friend Archie, he sent a link to another woodworker who can make you green with envy, and that is over at the Robert Van Empricus. There's a Q at the end of that, it looks like. That just doesn't look like a Q should belong there right after a C in between like an S. Is it just em Embrix then? Em just... Embrix maybe? But anyways, this is Architectural and Furniture Design. And once again, if you go in and you check out the projects, I don't like you anymore, Robert. You just want to punch him in the butt. Yes. <laughs> yes. With a very big stick. Maybe the one I was trying to <laughs> resaw the other day. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. There's so, a person anyways. who thinks on a different level. Yeah, that's it's a level that I hope one day to be looking up towards. So, and, and there's a couple of videos it looks like also on there. So check those out. Another one, we have another video. This one's from Ryan. Shannon, I think that we're going to get an idea for you right here. Um, <laughs> he says, here's a pretty cool video of a guy making a rocking chair with no power tools. And I, and I was thinking after watching this video, you know, maybe if, Shannon, now that you're done making those lathes you, uh, out of the trees, you, you could do this. <laughs> so... Uh, the neat thing about this is, uh, like I said, it, there's the no power tools. It's kind of fun. I still don't know quite how he did it. Uh, I have to say as an educational video, I didn't quite learn that much from it. As a fun video, it was definitely that. Um, but he I definitely would he's recommend. He's going to post an educational version later. So okay. this is like the sped up, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's what I did. consumption type video. It's what I did, not how I did it. Oh, gotcha. Right. Okay. Well, my other thing, though, is what the educational portion for me was the throwing the axe. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Well, we actually featured this guy in a previous uh, Wood Talk where he actually also did make a treadle lathe himself. And he um, refurbished a bunch of vintage parts from like a, you know, turn of the 20th century lathe. That's very, very cool. cool. Um, it's kind of a cross between a woodworking show and like a you know, one of those like junkyard wars type shows where he just went and <laughs> grabbed a bunch of stuff and fashioned it into something that actually worked. So it's a cool channel, definitely. Cool beans. Sweet. All right, let's move into poll of the week. Tom had a, a good one. It's do you turn like on a lathe? And I, oh, I, I, was I, say, I'm like, I can't turn left. Some of some of the uh, poll questions are like they're kind of like awkward questions you'd hear at a woodworking social. Right. You know, like people who don't know each other going so. So, so do you turn? 
<laughs> no, that's, that's the woodworking equivalent of what's your sign or what's your major yeah. do you turn? turn that would be fun to take some of these and totally put them into really unusual situations and just see what the reaction would be well we can try this at our meetup uh we do that. next week and just see how it, how it how it works out for us uh but yeah do you turn are you into turning stuff on the lathe uh 33 said i turn and it's okay i'm not sure what's okay it's just all right <laughs> you don't love it you don't hate it it's okay it's okay. Yeah, it's something I do just for, you know. Whatever. It's very yeah, apathetic. Make an income. Uh, 25% said I've never turned and may one day try it or not. These are very, very <laughs> apathetic <laughs> answers. Jeez. And or the, not. I just Whatever. Stop and- <laughs> and these are the ones with the most votes so far. Um, 23% say, I am fully into the Vortex and love it. 13 almost 14% say, I have never turned and desperately want to try it. Uh, 3% said I've never turned and never want to try it. And then uh, less than 1% said that I, I turn, but I hate it. <laughs> Only two people said that. So. Uh, polls, these polls are always entertaining. No, non Tell us people, what do you people really that, think? They yeah. just spent like $500 on a lathe and tools and like, I hate this. I hate it, it's but terrible. I'm going to keep doing it, but I hate it. God, how do those Scandinavian guys do this? I don't understand. <laughs> All right, let's get into some kickback. Uh, I'll take the first one here. Is from our buddy Kenji. He says, I'm using DMT diamond plates, and a little tip I learned is that there is a break-in period for these particular stones. When they're brand new, they're a lot coarser than than they're supposed to be, and your first initial use on them will not yield that near zero radius edge that you're looking for. But after you've used the stones for a little while, they'll break in, and you'll knock off the bigger grits on the stone, which prevent the mirror finish that you're trying to achieve. So that's that's good to know for folks who are, who are new to diamond plates or diamond stones, and you're going, what the heck is up with this thing? Um, <laughs> once it wears, it seems to really get to its uh, appropriate grit that you're looking for. I actually nice. think that applies to any, um, what's it called, artificial stone. Yeah. Because they they glue them together, and you end up with bigger chunks in the in the process that need to be worn down. So I'm not not sure. I mean, I think I've heard that before with diamond stones, but I think mm-hmm. I've also heard it associated with like um, why do I have trouble with this word? Synthetic, <laughs> synthetic <laughs> oil stones and such. I don't know if water stones are that because they're so much softer. But uh, you know, I've never I've never heard it, but I've experienced yeah. it, and I've I've got a couple of DMT plates that I use, but I typically focus on just the lower grits. And what I've noticed is in the areas that I use most often, there's a very di- a big difference. But because it's my lowest grit, I tend to to go to the areas that haven't been used much because I'm trying to grind a little bit harder. So I've noticed it, but I've never actually heard someone uh, say that it has a break-in period. So I was going to say that, that thinking about it, it would almost be like a bad thing with like a really coarse stone. Like if you had an extra coarse, you want it to be coarse. You don't want it to break in no. and get you know not as coarse. Then they go from extra coarse to like, eh, it's kind of coarse. Well, I think the problem is it was just artificially extra course oh, and the, ac- nice. the accurate course w- my scale of what i think is course is now all screwed up it is, yeah it definitely thanks that would dmt really mess with a woodworker well done that makes sense of course <laughs> yeah that i'm done all right hey let's move on to this next one this came in from dave and he says i know it's been mentioned on the show before but this is a really quick reply about the conundrum of the listener about which tool to purchase for trimming tenon cheeks shannon <laughs> was talking about using a router plane and capacity issues on longer tenons which is true it's a kickback so that won't die <laughs> <laughs> so why not make your own router plane with one side longer than the other and keep it just for the purpose of trimming tenons because asymmetry recommend- is for the devil <laughs> We were just at the art prize thing here in West Michigan, and there was a lot of asymmetry. And I have to say that it's very pretty. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, Dave was recommending a video from – it's Paul Sellers. And I, we did a little editing, and I forgot to say who it was from. Mm-hmm. But it's referred to as the video of a poor man's router and how to make one. And he goes on. There was a few other things that he mentioned, but he also says it actually does make me wonder why no manufacturer has caught on to the idea of making a proper permanent hand tool based on the principle of the poor man's router for the purpose of trimming tenons, i.e. a router plane with a really wide base Mm -hmm. only on one side. Well, here's the thing about that. That's easy to do because most router planes do, at least the Lee Valley one that I own, has holes on the top. And you can attach your own sub base to it and do exactly that. And uh, I've done this myself. I actually cover it in in the new book that's due out in November. You you got a book coming out? What book is that, Mark? It's uh, it's called Hybrid Woodworking. Oh, I'm not interested. Uh, 
Ooh, I am. What is I thought, it about? I thought with Tell the hand more. tools, I might grab you. Um, yeah. So what? <laughs> hand tools. I'm back. <laughs> Pull me back in. Uh, yeah. So you could just get a piece of like half inch plywood and extend the base out. And if you want to offset it, you can certainly do that. I'd rather keep it symmetrical so that I can go from either direction. Um, but it doesn't need to be more than uh, maybe eight to 10 inches from one side to the other. And it will substantially uh, improve your ability to overhang one side over a longer tenon like that. So if you already have a router plane, uh, which is, I think, a very good purchase, we'll, we'll get into that discussion a little bit later, I think. Um, it, it's not an, a very difficult upgrade. <laughs> you just cut a piece <laughs> of plywood and screw it to the base of the, the router plane, and you've got that extra support that you need really, really handy. Wow, so I you just will... made that router plane 20% better. Totally. Yeah. I will see your plywood base and up it with an acrylic base. Um, I did Whoa. the plywood thing for a while and it, you forget how much you actually like want to see what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and when you, now acrylic, it's kind of hard. It's really expensive to get thick acrylic, but you can go to like Home Depot and get, you know, whatever flimsy thickness acrylic and then attach two pieces of, of a harder wood like maple kind of on edge so you get the beam strength of the wood you run them on both the front and the back and it stiffens up the acrylic nice makes it really really firm and uh that's awesome i've done that before for wide um wide dados and things like that yeah because so, I, so I, acrylic was a regular uh material at the stepping stone museum <laughs> <laughs> of course it was yes, Matt. yes of course it grows we, on a we, plastic tree we brewed our own acrylic. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say though, I think one of the reasons this hasn't been made by a manufacturer is just sheer cost. Um, you're talking about a very, very specific use, and mm-hmm. to cast a base like that that would be, you know, wide enough and big enough would be really expensive. Yeah. Um, on the order of what you would pay for joiner planes and things like that. Now suddenly you've got this router plane that is. 300% more expensive than any other router plane on the market. And I have a feeling it probably wouldn't sell. <laughs> well, especially when all you need to do is mill two holes in it. And, you know, right. woodworkers who are generally that, they think like that. Like, how can I improve this tool with shop made stuff? And right. two holes should do the trick for you. Or just get a piece of wood and shove a chisel through it. As uh, <laughs> there you you'll, go. you'll find out with the poor man's router. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, what I had alluded to previously was in terms of like choosing what tools you would use uh, was in reference to a little discussion that we're going to have here. Now, Shannon, if you want to give a little synopsis of your recent article that was posted or um, uh, published in the latest Wood Magazine, if you would, and then we'll, we'll have a little discussion about it. I probably should have read that article, shouldn't I? <laughs> I read don't it. remember. You wrote it. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I, uh, I I didn't even know it was being published at the time. Nice. And I, I found out on Twitter. So I actually just finally went out and got my copy of it. But it was I was approached by um, Lucas over at uh, Wood Magazine about – uh, writing an article that's kind of, you know, obviously they are um, really honed in on the beginner woodworker and obviously on pretty heavily on the power tool side of things. Yeah, uh, They do a lot of, I guess what you would call crafty type projects, perfect like gift ideas and everything. It's always been one of my favorite magazines because it's really good at what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've they've got this like ongoing series of like construction tools, like dump trucks and things like that. And I'm just sad that my nephew is now too old for that because I don't have an excuse to build them anymore. <laughs> but it means it's like the I always look for this magazine come Christmas time because they've always got really great stuff. So it was the idea that for you know our readership that are pretty much all power tool guys and you can't help but notice there's this hand tool kind of thing movement going on everywhere, and you know where where to begin, how to kind of get into it. And we, we threw the idea around because I didn't want to necessarily do another, here's the list of the first tools you need to buy. Mm-hmm. It was more of here are here are three tools. I wanted it. Well, first of all, I was limited to like 400 words for this article. So, <laughs> you know, was, I couldn't do eight tools because there were no, no space. But I just started thinking what would be three tools that a power tool centric person could integrate into their shop and actually see some some real value from it. And my thought was could also be somewhat of a gateway into picking up more hand tools. So um, Mark then uh, emailed me and said, you know, the the tools you suggested are different from the ones I suggested. (laughs) So I suggested a carcass saw, a chisel, and a smoothing plane. And with them, I think that, you know, there's – 
there there are things that you can kind of replace or augment what you would normally do. I mean, obviously a smoothing plane, it may not replace sanding altogether, but it'll do away with a lot of sanding. Um, in, in some respects, it may do away with all your sanding, but it certainly can, you can smooth plane a surface and if it's still not, you know, right for you, you can jump right to 220 or 320 grit and that will save you a lot of effort. Chisel, I mean, what what can you not say about a chisel? There's so many things you can do with it. It's basically like the original woodworking tool. Yeah. All other tools are based on a chisel. You know, they're just, you know, a plane is a chisel with the blade at a set angle. A handsaw is basically a whole bunch of different little chisels. So the chisel is just kind of the end all be all tool. There's so many different things you can do with it. And then, um, you know, the carcass saw, I think sawing, you know, there's a lot of people talk about hand planes and hand planes are, are so great. And, I'm a handsaw guy. Um, I would much rather have my joints fit off the saw than have a bunch of extra joinery planes to tune it up or anything. Um, you know, a good accurate cut right off the bat with a saw will save you so much time elsewhere. And it's one of those things where, like a chisel, it's so incredibly flexible and agile. If you get in a weird situation and, you know, rather than build some jig for this one-off cut, just draw the line and, and saw to it. Mm -hmm. So it was it was kind of like... I think a little bit different from your point of view, Mark, in, in hybrid woodworking, where yeah. if I understand it correctly, it's kind of here are the tools you can use to augment and and you know follow up after you've done some some power tool work. I was thinking more of the line of as a power tool guy who just wants to dip his foot in the water, dip his toe in the water, and see what's this hand tool thing about, rather than send them down the path of buying a whole bunch of hand planes they've got to learn to use and they may not end up using them later um, let's get into some more uh, more immediate result type things yeah so, and, and that logic makes perfect sense and I think that that's why I thought this would be fun to talk about because I don't think anyone's right or wrong um, there there's ways that you could approach this depending on what your goals are and and that's exactly what I see with this list from you is it's almost like these these are the tools as, as you put it that would really want to inspire you to get deeper into the hand tool world and possibly right. even like at some point go all the way. Um, for me, it's more, I have no plans on, on going all the way into it. So there are certain tools that won't even make my list because I, I have ways to do those it, things already. Uh, and that's why it was, I was just really intrigued by this, by this list because you, you did three and my chapter that I talked about what tools I recommend as must haves, it was a chapter of a book. So I've got like eight things in there. So it's, it wasn't exactly like we're comparing the same type of list here. Uh, but for me, like a smoothing plane, for instance, um, and a lot of this comes from my personal experience too. Um, I got a smoothing plane early on. And it was actually more discouraging than anything to me. And part of it was lack of knowledge on how to use it or how to tune it up properly. Um, using it on woods that were a little bit more uh, tricky that you kind of, you need it to be tuned up real well and, and very well sharpened. Otherwise you just ruin the project. Um, so there were certain tools that I touched early on that just spoiled it for me and took a while for me to realize that, wait a minute, I can incorporate hand tools into my work. I just got to start with the right ones that give a power tool mindset person, good results right away that make them want to do it again. Um, mm. and, and so I guess, so a lot of it is tainted by my personal, <laughs> my personal issues, uh, that I had with hand tools early on. So it's a, it's a really valuable perspective though, because you know, I'm, I swallowed the pill and, and gone down the rabbit hole and I'm a total convert. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, I'm kind of the wrong person to ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Way to go Wood magazine. <laughs> nice job. Wrong guy. You guys suck. Um, but you know that is a that is a really interesting perspective because that that kind of shocks me to hear you say that. <clears throat> but I can see where you're coming from regarding the smoothing plane. That you know if you don't kind of know the the intricacies and the nuances of it, it's a good way to really screw up a project fast. Well, well, I think, think about there's probably the, a lot of people who've done that. Well, think about right. the power tool user buys you know buys the smoothing plane. They think okay, this is going to make my projects smoother and better than they would be if I used my sander. So they get the board out of the planer, they do a little glue up, everything's jointed real well, and they've got their panel, and then they just go to work. And maybe they don't know about grain direction, and maybe they don't know that they need to actually sharpen that iron when they get that plane. Uh, maybe they got a, a flea market special, and the thing is just, you know, <laughs> maybe Matt helped flatten the sole. Jeez. 
which I do. I, I have a van and I drive around to your house. <laughs> nice and service. Just bring it out and we'll take care of it. Matt's banana service. Um, so, but with those conditions and a person coming from that perspective, you do that on your panel and what's going to happen? You're going to ruin that panel. And what do you want to do? You take that plane and put it on the shelf and you probably don't touch it again for a while. Um, so, so what my perspective is to maybe focus on uh, things that power tool woodworkers might just understand better. And that comes down to finessing joinery. So a lot of my recommendations focus more on those. And we've talked about this in the past many times with uh, the importance of the router plane. Uh, and things like a rabbiting block plane and shoulder plane that tend to be a little bit safer, let's say, and actually set you up for more successes early on that might then make you understand hand tools and one day go, you know what? I really understand how this is working. I'm going to get that smoothing plane. I think I can I can tune it up now. I've done my research, that type of thing. So, so Matt, so, I'm curious what your perspective is on this because you're. Mm. Um, I know a lot of times we bill you as, as, as hand tool woodworker, at least... You know, I, from what I've seen with what you do and what you talk about, um, right. but you also use a healthy. Do- you're just talking about your bandsaw, and you got a saw stop. So you're more of a hybrid woodworker than than I think people realize. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, well, kind of along the lines of you, I I, I really when it, when it would come down to like if I was going to recommend a plate, I did do the thing where I I got the smoothing plane and I made all those mistakes, thinking like this was going to be the total awesome of the world. And I, <laughs> it'll it'll get rid of all my sandpaper and it'll take care of all these other things. And lo and behold, no, not at all. <laughs> so for me, like if if I were to like narrow it down to like just like I'm gonna just go with three the three tools. It would be like a like a, a, a really good panel saw, specifically like a cross cut saw, mm-hmm. because I have a rip saw and I can tell you how many times I've used it. Half. I've used it on almost half a board, and then I gave up and said I'm ripping this on a table saw or something. Yeah. Um, I for so for me it'd be like a cross cut panel saw, and then say like a block plane. I I will give my kingdom for a really good block plane because I just I feel like it can do just so much for me, yeah. and then it has to be uh, assorted chisels for sure. That's that's really the the, the three that you know pop up in my head because I use those three all the time. Like the project I was just working on, even that eight quarter that my bandsaw couldn't handle. I I broke it all down, all the materials so far using just my, my cross cut saw. Mm -hmm. I use that way more than I use my circular saw for uh, any type of breakdown of material. Uh, And then my, my block plane is just like that thing. If I could, I'd probably like sleep with it because it's amazing <laughs> next to me to keep me comfort. Ouch! You know, not the, <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, oh, okay. Not for anything else, there, buddies. I don't know you, what you guys are thinking. Uh, <laughs> you've already done that, haven't you, Matt? <laughs> no. You're, you're among friends. It's all right. Okay. Well, Sam was at a photography conference, and I just really needed something to cuddle. <laughs> no, uh, right. But then, of course, then like yeah, then my my chisels. But the funny thing is when. You guys first posted this on Facebook, like when this whole banter went back and forth. That happened to be the same day that I listened to another show, Modern Something Something Association. And they had Roy Underhill on. And he actually, at one point, they asked him, like, you know, what would be some essential tools? And the three things that he talked about that to him, this is all you need to get started, which I still have a hard time believing that's all you need. But he said, like, a panel saw, a jack plane, and then assorted chisels. That's he's like, you know, you start with that, you can build the world. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's the carpenter's I, toolbox, if you think about it. He built houses in Williamsburg <laughs> using chisels, a jack plane, and a panel saw. Yeah, so that's just, I mean, when, when I heard that, I just thought it was like, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> See, so basically what I said was similar to what Roy Underhill said, so, you know. Well, he said a jack plane. You said a smoothing plane. Yeah, I suppose. Jack Plane's up there on the list. I mean, Jack Plane is... It really is. It is. And that's the hard part of trying to, you know, narrow it down to three tools. It's yeah. just so hard to do. It's definitely difficult. And it's all about where you're Because I have from. to throw a router plane in there. I mean, I love the thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it, it is the only joinery plane that I recommended um, in my initial semester at the hand tool school because it can do all the jobs the other ones do. A little bit right. slower in some instances, but it can do it. Right. You know, but at the same time, I think somewhere down the road, you can ask me this question again next year, pretty much at the same time, and I bet you I'll I'll throw a different tool in there. <laughs> oh, totally. You totally. Know, and, it's, and, it's you know, so one subjective. year ago, one year ago, I would have been probably very much in the same camp where Mark is right now. Um, I've I've I admit I've gone a little off the deep end. Um, I've kind of gone to this this idea where you know I, I try to go as basic as I can in tools because. 
the minute you rely too much on the specialization stuff, you don't have the tool you need. And now you're, oh, I've got to go do this. And I, I hate feeling like I'm limited. Um, so I've taught myself, you know, a lot of sawing. I've taught myself a lot of kind of chisel handling. I don't know if that's the word <laughs> for it. So that uh, I don't run into that situation again. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's liberating, but there's a lot of practice that goes into it. So it, it could be a little little tough as an entry level type thing. You know, listen, listening to that admission just now, for some reason, the first thing that popped in my head is Steve Martin and the jerk when he is like being evicted from his house and he's like, I, I don't need anything except for this <laughs> ashtray. It's all I need. I it's need all the I need. And this That's little it. dog. That's all I need. I need this lamp. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's like my favorite scene. I love that scene. <laughs> well, hey, at, long, at least we can all agree chisels. Right. Yes. Oh, yeah. Chisels is, is the, <laughs> across the, the, the board. You <laughs> gotta have some chisels. <laughs> well, and I think that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, if you ever run into a situation where a, a tool can't do it for you, I guarantee you a chisel could do it. Right. It may be a hell of a lot slower, and it may have a lot more potential to go horribly wrong. Um, but that's why I think you know the chisel kind of gets underappreciated. Um, and yeah. if you really learn how to use it, and I'm a long way from mastering the chisel, um, you know, there are guys out there, David Charlesworth comes to mind. I mean, he's a savant with a chisel. Um, when you really have full control of a thing, there's really nothing you can't do. And to me, that's just really kind of empowering to have that single tool that can do so many things. Yeah, that's true. All right. Uh, what do we have next here? Email. Hooray. Email. Who's going to do emails today? Everybody. Okay. All right. Uh, so James wrote in. Uh, he asked a question. He says, I have a variable speed Bosch router that can run between 8,000 and 25,000 RPMs. Well, that'd be hard to keep up with. I bet you that's faster than a sprinter. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very funny. Never mind. Um, I'm looking for some type of guideline to follow when working with different thicknesses and densities and bit diameters. So far, this router is outstanding, as all Bosch tools are, and I usually run it around 12,000 RPMs for most projects. I'm planning on punching dog holes in my six-quarter maple workbench top and really don't want to burn up the motor, the bit, or uh, at, at the least, or least of all the worktop. Uh, when do I increase and decrease router speeds? All right, so this is uh, this is interesting stuff because a lot of times when it comes to a router, there's not just the router speed that you have to be concerned with. It's, uh, of course, the bit diameter, and then you've got feed rate as sort of an X factor. If you're going really slow, you might have a tendency to burn more, but if you're plowing through the stuff, you could create other types of problems and you have safety issues as well. So sometimes problems you notice may actually be solved with feed rate uh, before you even mess with the RPMs. So the first thing I'll say about it, he alluded to um, the the actual bit diameter. Most of these manufacturers, especially on the wider bits, will publish a rate, like a RPM rating that they recommend that bit be run at or one that you don't exceed because it's not safe to run it any, any higher than that. And that's usually what I use as my first uh, point if we're looking at something that's like a panel raising bit or a really big round over bit or something like that. Um, but most bits, you really just kind of want to run at the lowest speed you can get away with. Uh, so if he's running at about 12,000, that's actually not bad. Some people may think that that's low because a lot of other routers are running up closer to 20, 23,000 RPM. But, uh, you know, your standard small scale bits, you probably can get, get away with running at 12,000 RPM. So the first thing you want to do is, if, especially if you have some test scrap laying around, try it out and, and see what the results are because you want the, the lowest RPMs that give you a decent result. And the lower RPMs mean your router is quieter. It's much more pleasant to use as long as it's safe, as long as you're not exceeding the bits diameter, um, the recommendation based on that diameter, I think you're good to go. Um, so yeah, for me, I like to, to go, <clears throat> excuse me, to go, I lost my place in my notes here, but, uh, <laughs> sorry. I would like to go where I know where I am. <clears throat> this is what happens when I actually write notes down. It kind of screws <laughs> me up. Uh, you know, the other thing is let's, let's look at some situations. So you've got a possibility of burning. So if mm -hmm. you start to see burning, I usually try dropping the R RPMs a little bit or increasing the feed rate because usually when you get the burning, it's typically when you stall. Right. You're, right. you're pushing it along and you shift your feet and then move down a little bit further. That time where you just stopped for half a second, uh, the bit's staying in one place. So the faster that bit is going means the more time it's making contact with the wood, the more chance you have of actually burning. So, so when you see that burning, try dropping the RPMs or just speed up your feed rate a little bit. 
Uh, of course, extra wide bits, they need to be run slower. And if you see tear out, you may try speeding up your RPMs or slowing your feed rate. So you get more cuts per inch and you might have a chance of, uh, you, of course, you risk burning if you go, to, go too slow. But when it comes to tear out, sometimes I'd rather have a little bit of burning than have a big chunk of wood, you know, fly across the room. Um, so mm -hmm. you got a number of things to consider there, but ultimately safety first, review the manufacturer's recommendations, and then go based on your observations. And frankly, I don't really think too much other than the safety factor. I don't think too much about the, the RPMs. I kind of do exactly that. I look at the work and I try to get to the lowest one that gives me good results. Now, when, 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 would you say at all, mm -mm. and maybe I'm just completely missing this, do you, is this a point like where you would maybe listen to the motor like as you're doing this like would you be able to kind of like oh it's, that's running a little bit too fast or something or do you really more or yeah. less pay attention to either the burning or the tear out would, would, definitely which would you, you do most the, the thing <laughs> i would say that as one of the the criteria but that's so it's it's obscure and it's something that only comes with time right. uh, you may not necessarily hear a difference until you've done a few hundred board feet of of lumber through various bits that you go oh you know what that doesn't sound quite right so sound, right. you know, sound yeah. is totally an important factor, but it's something that you get with time. Um, the well, other thing, I mean, he's talking about maple. I'm assuming he's meaning hard maple. Yeah. So if the pitch changes from E flat to more of a G, you're <laughs> pushing it. Oh, no, so, G willikers. Yeah, exactly. See. <laughs> well, how, do you have this problem, Shannon, with your molding planes? Do you, actually, how fast are those running? <laughs> actually, I listen entirely to my molding planes. It's all about sound for me. Um, but uh, no, RPMs, there's not a lot of revolutions going on with, with my molding planes. Yeah, right. Not so much. Oh, actually, that'd be reach per minute, I think. Reach if you... per minute, nice. <laughs> reach Good one. Minute. I have calculated how far I've walked to make a, a molding plane. When you walk <laughs> up and down that eight-foot board, you can walk a mile pretty easily making a molding. It's interesting. Oh, wow. Maybe I should do that. I'll turn that into my health insurance and they'll knock me down. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I keep thinking. I keep thinking, you know, I really should be losing weight, but... <laughs> For some reason, it's not happening. I don't know. It's because there's a donut at the end of that board. <laughs> Ooh, a That's prize. Awesome. That would be great. I'm working for the prize. Well, I just played all this, so I can, I can indulge on three or four of these. Awesome. That's how you learn to use hand tools. Put a donut <laughs> at the other end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, well, I, I've got a question here from Christopher, and, and Christopher is saying I'm having trouble keeping a working edge on my iron on my plain irons. I'm using a King 4000 grit water stone as my final step in sharpening, and I get a very nice edge on them, but it never seems to last more than say a few days of infrequent use. Do you have any ideas? Uh, well, Christopher, I'm thinking it's it's not the water stone so much as I I, I have a feeling it's just the iron itself, and more than likely I, I'm wondering. What exactly is a few days of infrequent use? I mean, are you like doing it for a few days, you know, several times during those few days or something? So at least that's my first impression is that's what, that, what's going on here. So I might actually suggest altering the bevel angle on your plane irons, maybe increasing it. Like for myself, I have had a couple of plane irons and even chisel planes or chisel planes, chisel irons in the back in the past that at um, a, a lower uh, angle, say like, 25 30 degrees that bevel will kind of roll on me rather quickly so if i increase it to say 35 i suddenly get a much longer use out of those plain out of those irons again depending on what exactly i'm doing so i'm not convinced that it really has anything to do at all with the water stone uh to, to be quite honest and maybe he pulled the temper out too you could have a have an iron that got burnt or something and now it's it actually is softer because the temper has been drawn out um, through a you know too too much heat and grinding or something. Um, also, what's he planing? Yeah, that's <laughs> if, that's, that's if he's planing exactly Ipe, it. you know, or, or or teak even. I mean, teak is actually beautiful to work with, but it does wear your your irons out. Right. Um, although I think that gets overblown. Um, I haven't seen it in practice as much. Um, I, you know, the the other thing is, are you removing that wire edge? Are you removing the burr? Because um, if you leave that on um, and it actually comes off under stress, uh, it can leave kind of a ragged edge to it. Okay. Um, that's the only other thing. But, I mean, 4,000 grit is pretty high. I, I would imagine that if he, in fact, is getting that edge, you know, all the way down to the edge with 4,000 grit, it shouldn't be a problem. And there's a lot of people out there who will tell you 8,000, 32,000 grit. And, you know, the only thing the higher grit does is just polish it and make the scratches smaller. That's so what I was thinking. The edge, the edge will be more durable, 
Um, so if it's not the temper, if it's not the bevel angle and everything, you know, you could possibly add in a strop or add an 8,000 grit stone. That will help um, as far as durability. But, um, you know, maybe, I haven't maybe done it's the an actual issue testing. Where Christopher has gotten it so sharp that, you know, he, he now like the second it like has a moment of dull, he's like, oh, it's horrible. I can't do this. <laughs> it could be. If it's I can't just, just pull spoiled. the plane with a uh, with some, two, you know, uh, some floss or something and get some shavings like, you know, Jamil Abraham does. Uh, right. I can't do it. <laughs> so I was right. just distracted reading Facebook comments. Um, did you guys mention the possibility of it just being cheap metal? Bad, like bad. I think that's where Matt was going, but I guess we didn't overtly say that. But yeah, I mean, it could just be crappy. Because I've had some crappy chisels that that I was like, ah, come on! Like it would, it just does not hold. It gets brittle at the tip, and if it's just not high quality steel, then you know it's kind of just the nature of the beast. Unfortunately, yeah. I'll just throw a name out there: Buck Brothers. That's one (laughs) that for sure. I mean, like I, I I just accidentally I I test with paper to see if it's going to be sharp, and it dulls it in the in the process. Yeah, I mean, so. I think most post World War II hand tools, other than like the modern day, you know, Lee Nielsen's and such, um, I think they all have kind of lower quality steel, and it doesn't. The durability is is the major factor. It's not a matter of it doesn't get sharp enough. It just it sucks after a little while. <laughs> yeah, right? that's what but, you know. Looking at maybe like an aftermarket blade is definitely something you you know to consider because it's totally worth the price. I mean, if you're using hard maple and white oak and purple heart and stuff like that, it's mm. going to require more sharpening. It's just the way it is. You know, if you're doing nothing but, you know, cherry and walnut, then that should last longer. Pine, you know, pine is very, very soft, but the softer the wood, the sharper your iron needs to be. Mm. So um, I, I run into this a lot where I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm having problems. Well, what were you using? Hard maple? It's like, all right, <laughs> there's the problem. <laughs> right. Yeah, That's so why we again, call it hard maple. Yeah, so I, I would I, for me the the first thing I always think of is like I said, go to go to that higher bevel angle, try that out, see if it holds a little bit longer. If it doesn't, then yeah, it could just be crappy crappy steel or something. Hey, just a quick tangent: Did you guys see that Peter Ross? That one of the topics he's going to be doing at Woodworking in America is on like how do you correct like um, a, a steel that you mess up? Oh, really? No, oh, really. Yeah, I, I've got to find the thing. I was, I was looking at it the other day, trying to remember what things I I signed up for. I gotta be honest, I'm, like, I'm, I'm real hesitant to go to his seminars because I feel like I have a desire to get a forge. <laughs> I'm afraid it's gonna be really hot in there. I, there's there's this he just lingering brings us with him. <laughs> there's, there's just this penchant to to say, "Ooh, blacksmithing that can be fun." And I spent the summer working in the wood shop right across from the blacksmith and. It just sounds interesting. They get bigger crowds than the woodworkers too. So there's something about that. Well, you know, I saw a episode years ago of the Woodwright shop where he took like an old lawnmower blade and was making a specialty plane out of it. So he had to do a lot of metal work to chop this thing to the right size. And it was, it was awesome. And it was like, oh, yeah. the, it's exactly what you're talking about. And I could see why you would want to go in that direction. <laughs> Yeah, I, I could I could see that just being another rabbit hole that I yeah. don't really think I need in my life. Right. It, so I found the class. It's called How to Fix a Soft Tool. The first time it's going to be 9 a.m. on Friday morning. Say you anneal a tool on the grinder. What exactly does that mean? More important, how do you fix it? And he's going to show you how to rescue a tool from a bad session at the grinder and get it back to work. I'm not going to watch that because I don't want to know because I, I don't, I've... Just, just, I've made peace with those those items. You should just well, stay away from thing, the I think, If you do go out on Thursday night, actually, I think the modern woodworking guys are doing a, a, a go out and get drunk event on Thursday night. It's called the social. Probably 9 a.m. Friday, the sound of a hammer on an anvil might not be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, they they are having an, uh, an event. I just bl- uh, blogged about it today. Uh, 7 p.m., same place we're having our meetup, only on Thursday. So if you want to go with the Modern Woodworkers Association guys, and I, I don't know, will you guys be in by that time? I should. I'm not be. sure. I, uh, you know, it just depends on traffic. I'm yeah. leaving Thursday morning, yeah, so me too. I should be there by then. Yeah. But well, you might be able to run into some of us. Uh, but the MWA guys will certainly be there. So uh, definitely they go. Don't put a bad taste in the mouth of the woodwork. Or anyways, never mind. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Wow. All right. Moving on. Um, Hutch emailed us and said, what is your take on using bandsaw blades cut to length for use in turning bow and frame saws? Um, <clears throat> you hear about this talked uh, talked about a lot because especially when you get into the longer ones or the wider blades, it's really hard to find a source for these. And nine times out of 10, 
someone says it worked horribly. Um, and a lot of it, it has to do with the tooth geometry. A bandsaw blade has a very different tooth geometry than a handsaw blade. It's much more aggressive where the tooth is raked forward and that skip tooth pattern with that kind of um, kind of concavity underneath the, uh, the actual cutting edge, it makes it so aggressive that it's really hard to deal with with 1 16th horsepower, which trivia fact – or is it one fifteenth? Something like that. The human depends on human whose arm is doing it. <laughs> very little horsepower, put it that way. So when you're talking about getting the blade started, when you're talking about maintaining it um, without a lot of oomph behind it and a lot of RPM or just uh, you know um, rotation, if you will, um, it's really hard to use them. And what you end up doing is gripping the saw harder and trying to push harder, and it just doesn't work. It ends up not cutting in a straight line, deviating somehow, tearing up the board, causing a lot of tear out on the back side because the tooth geometry is just wrong. Um, and, you know, next time you, you grab a handsaw and grab a bandsaw blade and hold them up against one each other and you'll see what I mean. It's a very, very different looking tooth. So generally it could be a good place to start, but expect that you're going to have to do a fair amount of reshaping of those teeth. So, you know, not a good idea on like a three-eighths inch or narrower blade because you don't have much steel to work with in the first place so i suppose if you had like a one inch bandsaw blade um you're gonna have to reshape those teeth which is probably going to drop that actual point down at least an eighth of an inch um, and then you're gonna have to dig the gullet even further and you're just talking about a lot more work um you might be better off going to um i think it's highland highland woodworker sells a bunch of different blades for this they sell both hardened japanese style blades and more traditional western blades like 36 inches 12 inches 18 inches that's kind of the way to go if you're looking for a you know a real behemoth like my resaw frame saws then um uh, check out the article i did on my own website because i have a, a bladesmith that i work with who's actually making those blades custom and you can get a 36 inch or 40 inch blade with through um through isaac smith at blackburn tool works hmm. uh, so there you go. Nice. Good it's deal. It's all in the geometry. Well, if somebody's looking for a bandsaw blade, I have 93 and a half inches worth of a uh, bandsaw blade they can have. <laughs> nice dull bland bandsaw blade uh, that's for you. That's right. Yeah. Free to a good home. Because it's some good arm work out in there. <laughs> right. All right. So let's uh, look at our iTunes reviews. Uh, by the way, if you want to leave us a review on iTunes, you can do that. Just look us up in the iTunes store, click on ratings and reviews, and you can ask Matt how many licks it takes him to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop. Um, uh, lately, it's been about three. <laughs> Let's I just find out. Crunch. A one, two, who? All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we like to uh, thank Wannabe Woodworker and Dust Witch, who had this to say. Actually, Wannabe Woodworker said this. Love the show, guys. It allows me to spend part of the work week living vicariously through you, imagining myself in the workshop rather than in my cubicle. The perfect combination of information and entertainment. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate that. That's right not on. cool because I live vicariously through everybody else in the audience because I'm doing the same exact thing. <laughs> right. All right. So uh, you should also check out Festool at FestoolUSA.com as a sponsor of the show. And we'd like to thank some of our recurring donors, Bobby Slack and Jason P. Uh, both of those guys helped us out. And you can, too, if you go to WoodTalkShow.com and you look over in the left-hand column, you'll see some links for uh, one-time donation and, uh, you know, very inexpensive one, $2 five dollar recurring donations every little bit helps out and uh, we really appreciate that for everybody who donates and I, I really like the benevolent caretaker uh, <laughs> level if people want to pick that one up they should really consider it for the low low price of two hundred dollars a month that's right you can, you can okay, help directly out matt. to matt vanderlis <laughs> right all right so matt you want to give them the contact info and we'll get out of here all right, folks. Hey, you have a comment, a question, or maybe a topic suggestion. You have several different ways to get a hold of us, especially to ask Shannon. Are you sure four lathes is enough? Don't you need maybe <laughs> half a dozen more? Let's be realistic. Come on. There's too many trees out in the world that need to do something. <laughs> There's an empty them. spot in the corner over there. <laughs> exactly. Hey, so you can leave us a voicemail on Skype. Our username is Wood Talk Online. Call our voicemail line at 623-242-5180. Oh, my God. I had a Bobby Brady moment there. Uh, email us at woodtalkonline at gmail.com or leave us a comment on our Wood Talk Facebook page. And if you're ever looking for the show notes or downloads from today's show or previous episodes, you're going to find those over at woodtalkshow.com. And you know what? I haven't mentioned this in a while. I was thinking about this the other day. Do you guys know that we have our own individual sites also? What? 
I know. It's crazy. Mm. Like, like Mark, you're over at thewoodwhisperer.com. I am. Shannon, you're available at renaissancewoodworker.com, and I'm at madsbasementworkshop.com. So you can always head over there and visit with us individually and tell us how you like us better than those other guys. Wow. Whoa. That's competitive of you. No, I, well, I mean, I mean it in the nicest way. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll catch you next time. See ya. See ya. All right. Where's that stupid button? <laughs>